Thanks, Chris, for the uh, musical introduction. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I hope you all enjoyed Simon's and Robert's talks as much as I did. I'm always really impressed by the uh, creative thinking that, that takes place and is displayed at uh, conferences like here today. But um, I'm actually a little cocky about it. I, I kind of feel like, hey, you know, this is America. This is what we do. This is what we're good at. We're the innovators. Um, and for most of my life, I just sort of took that for granted. But a few years ago, a few years ago, I had a couple of experiences, this is my first slide, um, which actually changed my mind a little bit about uh, what it means and how we, how we came to be a creative society, um, how that innovation spirit or innovation culture uh, is maintained in our society, and maybe um, you know whether it's uh, going to stay here forever or there are things we need to do to actively maintain it. So the first of those experiences was um, a trip I took to South Africa to see the opening of an MIT Fab Lab down there. Um, everybody know what a Fab Lab is? No. no. A Fab Lab is a, a community workshop with high-tech tools, manufacturing tools, computers, software, electronics. And uh, the innovation came out of MIT, and MIT is good at innovation. They, um, they came up with a way of setting these up relatively inexpensively and there's now a network of these all over the world. If you just sort of look up uh, Fab Lab on uh, Google, you'll find lots of information about them, and there are a lot of them in the US as well. But um, that South African Fab Lab uh, enabled me to see lots of young people from a township outside of Johannesburg with no technical education, very poor education, in fact, uh, able within a couple of hours of sitting down at a computer to design their own toys and make them with a laser engraver. They didn't have to know what a laser engraver was, but they could see how it worked. And as soon as they, they got their hands, were able to uh, get their hands dirty with those tools, you could just feel the energy, feel the, uh, the new ideas coming about. And it's that kind of, I think that kind of energy and exposure to those opportunities early in life that really led in part to our becoming a, creat a creative society, work like uh, Simon Hauger does. Another experience that was really formative and, and kind of making me start to question how we got to be a creative and, and innovative society was uh, related to a colleague of mine back at Cornell University. On the left, you see Victor Zykoff. Victor's a, a fantastic engineer, roboticist, PhD. He came to study at Cornell University along with us uh, up there from Russia. And he brought excellent technical background, but he was a very creative person. And, uh, for some reason, he wanted to study in the United States. And that's one of the things that got me scratching my head, like why you know, there's lots of places this guy could go. Why did he decide to come to the US? Well, some of the things Victor worked on while he was at Cornell include robots like this one that constantly model its uh, body shape uh, through sensors, such that if you break its leg off, it realizes its leg is broken. It can evolve a new way of walking. So like the Terminator, it can claw its way across the floor even when injured. It's a little scary. <laughs> Victor also worked on these modular robots, which are actually capable of self-replication in a very controlled environment. Another thing that's a little bit scary, if you have you know, unstoppable robots that can reproduce. <laughs> but uh, you know, partway through Victor's PhD program, he disappeared from Cornell for about six weeks. He'd gone home for the holidays, and then he couldn't come back. It turned out this was after the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the United States. And we had clamped down on the immigration policies here as, uh, you know, as a desperate attempt to try and prevent more attacks from taking place. Victor was uh, unfortunately caught up in this. And um, <clears throat> I apologize for that. And for a long time, we had to joke with him when he did finally come back that if the United States didn't want to welcome Victor, North Korea or Iran would be happy to have these weapons. Uh, it's our good fortune that, that Victor actually did want to come to the United States, and, and he and I talked about it a little bit. Um, his main reason for coming to the United States was that he wanted to make cool stuff. Those were his words, I think, more or less exactly. Uh, and why did he think he could make cool stuff here? Well, I think our higher education system just had that reputation. It's a place where innovation takes place. Uh, we have open minds to radical new ideas, and we foster them in our university system. Victor also came from a very cold part of Russia, and I know he was fascinated with the lifestyle, the freedom, and the warm weather in California 
and it's his good fortune that he did end up finding a job out there. At least for a while, he was working at a, a cutting edge renewable energy company called Makani Power out there in California. And he's with us still. <clears throat> but all this got me to thinking about, you know, how did this whole reputation as innovators start? And I think it has something to do with the history of this country. Oops. Oh, yeah, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Forward one slide, please. Thank you. So this country was founded as a place for people to escape from tyranny, escape from oppression. People braved great hardships, crossed the oceans, and had to forge their way in uncharted territory in order to set up their families here. As a result, we have a population, a diverse population, of highly motivated people, self-selected by their willingness to come here and, and try new things. Over time, they spread across the country. They opened up new areas, found access to new land resources, natural resources. And that, in turn, started a feedback, drawing more people in, giving them access to more resources. By World War II, there was another great wave of oppression in Europe. <clears throat> A very sound strategic decision was made by our government to actively recruit the best and brightest minds from Europe over here. And so we got an enormous infusion of talent, capability, motivation that really elevated our education system. At the same time, the war machine had made enormous economic incentives for innovative solutions to technical problems. So now this, this feedback is not only that we have this diverse, motivated education, po sorry, educated population, but that there are opportunities they can take advantage of to create new solutions to problems, and they can be rewarded for that. That, in turn, creates new jobs for innovators, which then puts that demand into the education system to create innovators, and you see the whole system become self-reinforcing. At the same time, we're siphoning off knowledge from other countries. We become the sink for all the good, smart people and, and the bright information out there. <clears throat> Uh, so for the second half of the 20th century, we're really benefiting from this. Our established education system is really drawing the best and brightest from all across the world. Those people are coming here and they're staying because of the economic opportunities, the ready capital for startup businesses, and a friendly immigration policy that makes them feel welcome here. A diverse society that accepts them and accepts their different perspectives, and in fact encourages those differences. So this is really, I think, how we got to that reputation that uh, drew people like Victor here. And this is something that, although we've got these nice uh, sustained feedback loops going on here, it doesn't have to stay that way. Things can disrupt these feedbacks. It can stop being self-sustaining over time. Much as we stole information and, uh, from Europe, that information can leak back out of the United States. In the 1990s, with the advent of the internet, some interesting things started happening. Now, uh, very low cost and, and highly effective telecommunications means that com companies in the United States can consider accessing lower cost labor overseas, especially in countries like India where the culture is relatively similar and they speak English. So a lot of back office activities started to be offshored. Uh, things like accounting, uh, customer service. I think a lot of people have experienced the Indian customer service person as kind of a running joke, I guess, to some extent. But now I think they're, they're really well established. They do a good job. And this was, for at least in short term, a very uh, great way for our companies to become more cost effective. But at the same time, it's creating econo economic opportunities offshore, and it's reducing economic opportunities here. Those jobs are now moved offshore. The money that pays those people is going to that other company or country. And now there's incentives over there for them to provide more intelligent people to serve those jobs and they start their own companies to provide those services to us. So you see there's a, a leaking out. <clears throat> so it, it, it's a funny thing, once you start establishing a, an infrastructure for that kind of offshore activity, it's really easy to look around you and say, hey, you know, Bob, who's in that department next door, he doesn't really seem that essential, um, or he doesn't seem like he's as, as, as essential as his uh, pay grade would suggest. We should be able to offshore that stuff as well. 
So more and more activity in, in the organization can be easily offshored once the infrastructure is set up. And that has been the natural tendency. It's uh, probably not a shock to anybody here. The, all of our manufacturing is pretty much done offshore now. And you can see the rate of growth in, in manufacturing investment by US corporations overseas. So we've lost all those skills to a large extent. All that uh, innovation capacity from World War II is kind of evaporated. Uh, and it's now being established in China and other countries, Ireland and so on. Ireland uh, is, seems less scary to me than China because their culture is similar, but they're just as much, uh, you know, taking economic uh, opportunities away from us or, or we're giving them the economic opportunities. More, um, more concerning to me is the fact that organizations are offshoring more and more of the, the creative activity, the innovations. Uh, for instance, there's really rapid growth right now in R&D in uh, pharmaceuticals and that's taking place in India. So now actually the product development, the ideas that are making the economic opportunities are, are happening in other countries. And you know, I, I have this sort of vision in mind of just a stack of papers in a drawer somewhere becoming the company and everything is offshore. <laughs> so in 2001 to 2004 where my story started with Victor and all, we had a big economic downturn associated with the terrorist attacks and a tightening of our immigration. What this means is that now people who were coming here attracted to the, uh, the fine education we offer and attracted to the economic opportunities to set up their businesses and live the lifestyle that they want to live, we're no longer able to do that. They're, they're being turned away or even if they can complete an education here, they're often unable to get jobs that keep them here or visas to stay on and work. So we've actually broken some of those feedback loops. And you can see in the, the trend data for issuing of visas how the immigration policy has affected things. Uh, the top line, the, I think the blue line up top, is student visas issued. And that peak was 2001. And then look at the drop off following 2001. That's what Victor got caught up in, that tightening of immigration policy. Now things have returned to normal more or less. There's been rapid growth again. But if you look at some of the lower lines, particularly the, the red one and the purple at the bottom, those are work-related visas. So what these indicate to me, because those are rising up to 2001 and then plateauing or dropping off continuously since then, is that those students that used to come here, study, and stay are now studying and leaving. Why? Well, because a lot of them feel that uh, you know, they're not so welcome anymore. The immigration system is not supporting them. It's not inviting them in. A large fraction of them in this survey from 2009 are concerned about being able to get work visas to stay on. So in 2008, we had another whammy. We had the, uh, the housing bubble burst. And now all that ready capital that was helping people start up their businesses is gone. So now there's even another incentive for people to go back home. And why wouldn't they? No. They feel like the economic best times in the United States are in the past. Oops. Go back one, please. <clears throat> and if they're going to start up a business anywhere, it's not likely to be in the United States. It's going to be in their home country. And why not? Look at how China's investing in science and technology. Look at the rate of growth in the upper left here of uh, new degrees in science, engineering, and technology. And on the upper right is jobs, basically, in those fields. This is full-time employed researchers. The United States is growing a little bit. China doubled over the course of seven years and is now more uh, researchers, full-time employed researchers than the United States has and still growing rapidly. Meanwhile, back home on the lower left, Jobs are stagnant here in those high-tech fields that used to draw most of the, the uh, students into work. So although we say we need more students to go into STEM fields, we don't really have the employment for them right now. So that's a real concern. So this is sounding pretty bleak, especially after the upbeat talks that came before. Um, and I, I don't want to end on that note. What I'd like to say is, is that there are things we can do. Uh, we can certainly ask our government to take some actions to try to restore those feedback loops that 
made us innovating culture, help revive it. Things like making the immigration policy a little more welcoming, obviously we have to be careful, but it could certainly be a lot friendlier to the best and the brightest, and, and even anybody who's coming here working hard, motivated to get here, people take risks to come here, they should be welcomed and uh, assisted with uh, you know, getting the best possible education and contributing to our society. <clears throat> Clear, stable policies so that uh, risky R&D ventures know that the government's not going to turn around and switch things up as soon as they get halfway into a project. How's that? Thank you. Uh, R&D incentives, I think, like uh, tax deductions for R&D would be very effective. And lastly, oops, where am I? grant challenges, as was mentioned, uh, Things like the DARPA Grant Challenge are a very efficient way of spending a, a relatively small amount of taxpayer money, but inspire a huge knock-on effect where corporations and uh, universities contribute uh, much more resources than the prize money itself just for the pride of winning and being, being the innovator. Uh, more importantly than, than waiting around for the government to do something, though, are things we can do for ourselves uh, and in support of uh, our culture of innovation. Uh, first, I'd just like to say buy drinks, by which I mean be a welcoming society, you know. Foster immigration, talk about, talk about how wonderful things can be here in the United States and just be, uh, be a good ambassador for the United States. A lot of people tend to, to put it down, and there are good things and bad things about here, certainly. But uh, I think we can be a lot more inviting to immigrants personally. <clears throat> um, Supporting projects like Simon's X Prize effort are, are tremendously valuable. That project-based learning, I'm a huge fan of as well. Uh, there are lots of new R&D sources that are less expensive and non-traditional. Things like Innocentive, Kickstarter, and so on that are fostering a market of innovation. Uh, Facilities are now available for hire for R&D. Things like Tech Shop and Philadelphia's own NextFab Studio make it possible to do R&D without owning the R&D facility. Evan, I'm going to give you one more minute because of the bad stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and uh, most exciting are this thing called uh, hacker spaces. This is innovation as a social activity. Uh, in, uh, hacker spaces are booming worldwide. These are, these are fab labs or places where people to get together with tools to uh, problem solve, teach each other how to do things, and come up with new solutions and new answers. And I love the idea that this could be the recreation of the future. As opposed to being a couch potato, we could sit and teach each other, come up with solutions to problems for fun. And the U.S. market share of hacker spaces is increasing rapidly. Lastly, I just want to say that there isn't any magic that keeps us an innovating culture. It's, it's up to us to do our part to uh, help sustain those feedback loops. We have to understand the interaction between culture, our reputation, welcoming immigration policy, economic opportunity, and it's a big complex problem, but if we make coherent effort to support all those factors that, that encourage innovation, we can help maintain that innovation advantage here in the United States. Thank you very much.